So, hello everyone. It's nice to see so many faces here, although it's hard to see with all this shine up here. So yeah, I'm going to give you like a progress update on how we actually are starting to use, I would say, high throughput, long read data to assemble complete genomes from major genomes. Now, this is like preaching to the choir here, I guess, but if there's some human people here, everything in nature is bacteria. We have so many bacteria around us, as, and as we heard before, we lack so many genomes from these bacteria, so tiny amount of the bacteria we actually know right now. So if you take the, the picture be here, behind you as like the all bacteria in the world, we actually only know like a tiny bit of them. So just a tiny bit of the diversity out there we actually have genomes for. So how do we actually get the genomes? Yes, we should definitely start culturing. But culturing is hard and tedious and no one really wants to do it. But this is really important. But this is, is something that takes time. Something that's been up for many years too is single cell genomics. Again, you can take a single cell and actually sequence it. I think it's really, really cool. But it's also really, really hard. It's, it's like a freaking single cell. And getting a complete genome from that is, is challenging. So what a lot of people have been doing for some years now is starting to use metagenomics instead trying to simply sequence everything and reconstruct genomes from there. And in principle, it's actually relatively simple. So we take a, a complex community with many bacteria, just extract all the DNA, we sequence it. In, we used to do it with Illumina sequencing, just sequencing a lot of data. And before, the limiting factor has really been that we didn't sequence deep enough. But now we can actually sequence deep enough that we, at least in theory, have enough data to start to uh, assemble all the genomes down there. So what you do, you take the short reads, you try to assemble them, and then you don't get complete genomes out. So why don't you get complete genomes out? And there's actually only two basic limitations, it turns out. One is microdiversity, so many closely related strains. And the second is really trying to separate all the hundreds of genomes from each other afterwards. And I'm just going to tackle these one by one. The sequencing is fun and quite challenging. You can com compare it to taking a newspaper, shredding it into small pieces and trying to make it out to a, to a complete genome again. But the algorithm development has really been fast. So we're actually able to do this quite, quite, quite nicely now. This has really been, been nice. Now go to metagenomics instead. So now you don't have one newspaper. You have a pile of newspapers. This is actually quite easy to assemble if this is a Chinese newspaper and an American newspaper and a Danish newspaper. They are very different. So the, bac the bacteria are very different. This is as easy as standard genome assembly. The problem is that the newspapers are different versions of like New York Times. They are very closely related and trying to reconstruct that is really difficult. So when you try to assemble it with the short reads, you basically get bit bigger pieces out, but really not going to the complete genomes yet. This is really difficult with all the strains we have. So this is one problem. The second is spinning. I would say that's, that's relatively solved now. So the, the way that most people do it is we take a sample. When we do metagenome sequencing, you actually keep the abundance information of the bacteria. So if you're, let's say, dark blue bacteria is three times more abundant than the other bacteria, when you sequence it, you can actually measure that out in the end. So you can measure the abundance of the bacteria using sequencing. The way you use it is quite simple. You simply take your sample, then you plot the abundance of the bacteria. Then a lot of the bacteria will be in the same abundance. They're hard to distinguish. So you make a simple trick. Just take another sample where they are in different abundance. This could be a different time point or just a location next by or different extraction methods. Just generate differential coverage. Then you combine these two abundance informations. And now you can actually separate the genomes out quite easily. Now, it's not complete genomes yet. It's often like small pieces, but you can actually collocate them and figure out what belongs together. So onto some real data instead. So this is what's been done with really a lot of Illumina data. And we thought, OK, what happens when we really start to add high throughput long reads into this case? And we've been running, I would say, high throughput long reads by two min ions. We also have the Prometheus ion, but we are still waiting for nice flow cells to really get high throughput data. But the mean ions actually start to get up in the gigabase range, so we can actually start to tackle some of the more complex communities here, too. So one of our demonstration studies that we've been doing is simply taking one, I would say, medium complexity 
environment, sequence using Illumina data, the exact same sample, and also sequence it using Nanopore. And we spend roughly the same amount of money on the sequencing. And still for the same money, you get more or less half the data gigabases in Nanopore now. So it's really starting to be feasible to do. So this is how it looks when you actually do differential coverage binning. So it's a bit complex figure. I'm just going to walk you shortly through it. So this is taking the Illumina data and just assembling the Illumina data. So each point here is a piece of DNA. It's scaled by how big a piece of DNA it got assembled. And then I overlaid the GC content just to show some structure. And on one axis, you have the abundance in one sample and the abundance in the second sample. And what you can hopefully see is there's some clusters, and that's actually individual bacterial genomes we can start to pull out. And this is really how it looks when you do Illumina data, that you can actually start to pull out draft genomes, I would say, or metagenome bins. And if you look at the assembly stats, this is what I would call a decent Illumina assembly. You have 400 megabases of data of sequence assembled, 100,000 scaffolds, and N50 of 5 KB, but still something nice and big context assembles. So what happens when we actually start to do it the other way, when we take high throughput long reach data and start to assemble that? Then it looks something like this instead. And hopefully you can see just by the dot size, we really start to get big pieces of DNA assembled suddenly. And if you go over and look at the stats on how, we, how the, the basic stats looks, we still assemble quite a lot of data, so 150 megabases, but now we only have 2,000 scaffolds. We reach N50 values of like 100 KB. So just turning it the other way, starting from long read data and sampling that, we start to, have to actually reconstruct many of the data. And what you can see hopefully here is there's also some fun thing happening. So up here, there's like a small pieces, small context assembling, but really not much data. And this is one of the most abundant bacteria. We don't see it with the Illumina data. And that's basically because of strain variation. So many closely related strains. But it seems like when we actually start to add the long reads, we change this strain problem to something else. And we actually start to be able to assemble the complete genomes again. So how do we actually do it? If you go into more detail, I don't have really much time to actually go into detail how we do it. But one thing is we try to simplify the process of, of doing it. So first off, we take the nanopore reads, we subset to only large reads, so above 4 KB, and that keeps most of the data, actually. So now we have a set of high quality long reads that's needed to actually bridge much of the strain diversity. We make a quick and dirty assembly with mini SM. This is really quick and dirty and I would say like a, a naive assembler just puts thing, things together without too many assumptions of how it works. That means you can quick and dirty get a nice assembly from long reads. Mini SM keeps the original error rate so we polish it up using Raccoon. Now it's in a grade where you can actually start to map Illumina data down to it. So we take all our Illumina data, we still do a lot of Illumina data for like different time points. We map it down. So now we have a big assembly, we have differential coverage data, and we can actually start to bin the data out. So going from this assembly, we do binning. So we take out small pieces that we think is a single genome, and then we actually just re recruit all reads, all long reads, all short reads, and then we treat it as a completely normal genome assembly using Unicycler or the other tools available. So we go very fast from a huge complex data sets. We just assemble it using MiniSM. We do binning, and then we just reassemble it using uh, Unicycler. That means you just you cut out the different parts that are often difficult. So it's difficult to do many assemblers on medium data, but using a naive, quick and dirty assembler, that really makes it feasible to start doing. So it works better than expected, and currently we are really exploring the impact of strain diversity, how, how much impact does that have, and where can we actually go from here to actually solving this. But we seem to actually be very close to high quality genomes, even from complex samples using long reads. So just to wrap it up, if this was our culture-based uh, window to the world, the introduction of metagenomics and differential coverage binning meant that we can actually start to really see much of what have been hidden before. And at least our really initial results say that, that long reads was really making a huge progress here. We start really to be able to assemble some of the strain diversity and also starting to actually integrate that and deconvolute them afterwards. And with that, I just need to thank my, my lab team. I have an awesome team at home where I actually do method development, sequencing, and assembly from start to finish. And thank you for listening.
Thanks for the great talk, Mads. Uh, any questions for Mads? The microphone's just coming. Hi. Hi. Um, it, do you ever see that when you do the miniasm assembly and you get these nice big contigs that occasionally the contigs are wrong? They're, you know, a combination of two different species. It, it, do you see that or do you have a way to check for that because potentially that could, you know, affect the downstream parts of your yeah, analysis? Yeah, 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 definitely. But the nice thing is when you have cover information, you can quite easily see if it's assembly of two different strains because you have differential in coverage of it. So some parts of the contact will be in high coverage and some in low coverage. But it's, it's actually a much less a problem than I actually thought. It's rare, quite rarely we actually see it and I was really surprised. But I think when we actually start to get the the long reach, just the gene structure is different between the strains. So it's, it's what, what co-assemble is, it's really closely related strains. And that means you are, the next problem is then using like SNPs to figure out which strains is from there. But like assembling the whole chromosome seems quite feasible because you have long pieces of DNA. So you're down to, I would say, SNP level strain variations and, and a few genes. And that can be teased out decently using coverage information. So it surpri works surprisingly well. So far. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Matt. So we'll uh, save the rest of the questions for the for the panel session at the end.